Hey guys, it's Runchix, and my guest this week was Elliot Rowe, and wow, what a conversation we had. He's one of the top mental game and performance coaches in poker industry. Many people I know have high praise for him, and I myself am a big fan of his podcast, but I never saw any of his coaching work before. Perhaps the hypnotherapist part was making me frown a bit, but well, I was really impressed by how Elliot expresses his thoughts and pinpoints critical areas. We discussed so many important ideas and concepts in this conversation, so I hope you guys enjoy it, as there is so much to learn here. And by the way, right after talking to Elliot, I went on and bought his course. Right now he's offering a 70% discount for a limited time, so the price is just under $300. It is an incredible value. And on top of that, during the COVID crisis, he's doing weekly one-hour group Q&A sessions with all students where you can ask him for guidance and tips. I just participated in one of these sessions and I am definitely coming back next week. I think that especially with the discount, buying this course might be one of the best investments you can make in yourself right now. We have the link to that deal in the description, so make sure to check it out. Oh, and just a reminder, as always, we have timestamps in the description. And for those of you wondering what the hell is going on with the new layout and stuff, well, I'm so glad to announce that we are making several exciting changes to the podcast. You can now listen to us on iTunes or any other podcast platform of your choice. And we also have a dedicated newsletter where I'm going to share regular updates with you about the new episodes, ideas that I found the most insightful and an occasional random thought. You can subscribe to it on runchexpodcast.com. And now, enjoy our conversation. And we're live. Hey, well, this was exciting. Me on. We got there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you for being here. And like you said, we got here because uh, I've been uh, playing around with all sorts of technical things. But um, anyway, so let's get into it. Uh, I have so many questions and we obviously have about an hour today, right? So we yeah. won't be able to, because I would love to pick your brain for the next uh, couple of days if I, <laughs> if I could, you know, but let's start with, I mean, obviously you're one of the biggest names in the performance and mental game coaching in, in poker world. Yeah. And I wonder how does one become a performance and mental game coach? Like how, how did it happen for you? For for me um, personally, I, um, I I was qualified as a hypnotherapist. So um, I I trained as a hypnotherapist, and I was working with clients in different areas. So when I first finished uh, my training as a hypnotherapist, I would do some work um, with people in weight loss and quit smoking and fear of whatever it might be, um, as most hypnotherapists do. And then I was also working with some. Um, just sort of amateur golfers, people taking it seriously, but not professional level. And I was getting some good success with them. Um, I had a friend who worked in the poker industry and I was talking about the success that I was having with golfers, not feeling as stressed when they were putting. And um, she said, Hey, I work in poker guys getting stressed at the poker table costs them a lot of money. You should try working with poker players. And this is back, I think in 2011. Um, put out a, a thread on two plus two offering free coaching um, for people who wanted to try it. And I did that for a few months and I got success with some of the early people who were, who were in their free coaching. They recommended friends who recommended friends um, started charging for coaching. And then really in terms of how, how I became where I am in the industry, everything was based on results and everything was based on word of mouth because as you can imagine selling hypnotherapy to poker players, you know, quite a skeptical audience, um, advertising doesn't really work. Um, so nearly every client I've ever had has been the vast majority have just been a recommendation from a friend who's already worked with me. And I've been fortunate enough that over the last decade, um, the players got more and more successful. I started working with more bigger names. I've been involved with some of the more interesting stories, I would say, over the last 10 years. Um, you know, some, some pretty cool stuff has happened with some clients I've been working with. And because of that, I've, I've managed to get to where I am in the industry. Right. And since you had the experience of working with professional golfers mm. and obviously with, with a lot of some of the most successful players in, in the poker world, do you see a difference 
uh, working with these two groups of people? Like some stark differences that stand out? Um, well, what's interesting is, I mean, I, I work with a lot of sports now. So, you know, as well as poker players now, I'm working with Olympians. I've worked with UFC champions, professional boxers, like you know, team sport athletes, international athletes, you know, rugby players and such. Um, and the sessions are identical, virtually. The issues that the people um, come to the table with are all, almost identical in all of the different situations, whether it's me working with a professional athlete, me working with a CEO of a company, someone on Wall Street. Almost everything I see comes down to self-sabotage, a fear of failure, a fear of success, and then improving their focus and their flow state for whatever activity they're looking to do. And um, you know that's that's what I see. That if you can remove someone's barriers, if you can remove their self-sabotage, and then you can help them get into a flow state where they're absolutely focused on whatever their skill area is, um, typically they'll they'll have an outsized performance, a, a much better performance than they would have had if they're not in that place. And um, yeah, ironically, a session with a UFC champion is not very different to a session with a, uh, <laughs> a poker grinder. Wow. So I'm I'm really fascinated by what you're saying that you know the the main problems seem to be self sabotage, mm -hmm. uh, fear of failure. So basically, your biggest enemy is yourself. I, I believe that to be the case. Um, something that that I always say around this is I don't believe that poker creates the issues that people have the mental game issues. I believe you bring them to the table, and and it's the same for everywhere else in life as well. Um, and then as you progress up, the, the stakes become higher and the chance of bringing something to the table that maybe you didn't bring to the table at lower stakes is there. So um, you know, everything's just amplified as you get closer to the top of the game. And the work I do is helping people overcome the fact that you know, suddenly the one hand at the table might be the money that their dad made every year. And how do they deal with the fact that that's, is, you know, a very strange situation for a lot of people to be in. And how do you deal with that effectively? And how do you play the hand the same way that you would have played it if it was, you know, playing one, two? Um, obviously, the, the strategy might be different, but you, you get what I mean in terms mm -hmm. of you don't change the way you play the number of big blinds, particularly. And yeah, that's, that's something that the individual brings to the table. And if we can overcome the self-sabotage with that, the worries around money, the worries around loss, the how will I, will I look stupid in this situation? And even the what does it mean if I become truly successful? Um, a lot of the substock conscious stuff that comes up is around, you know, will my friends still like me if I become the most successful of all my friends? What does it do with my relationship with my girlfriend? What does it do with my relationship with my parents if I am making twice the money my dad ever made? And, you know, he was really proud of the fact he was making that money and working 80 hours a week. So, you know, all of these things come into play. And as I said, not just in poker, but in some form of anyone trying to reach the top of performance in, in anything that they're doing, these, these fears always start to show themselves. And if we can remove the fears or even really we're just looking to reduce the fear. So, um, you know, if we can take a fear down from a nine to a three, the person's behavior is going to be different and their performance is going to be different. Wow. So many things I want to expand on here really, because, mm -hmm. uh, it's so powerful, especially that, you know, you've mentioned the fear, not the fear, but I don't remember how you exactly phrased it, but yeah, the fear of success, hmm. right? I've never thought about it before, really. Now that you say these things, it, like a lot of things click into place and I realize, wow, I've seen this happen in, in my friends. I've seen some of it happen uh, in myself in a way. And coincidentally, um, it was actually yesterday that I stumbled on a, on a video about Dave Chappelle um, walking away from 50 million deal uh, some, whatever, 10 years ago where yeah. he had the, the huge show on Comedy Central and he decided to walk away from that. And there was a lot of speculation. He went crazy. He went to the mental asylum and whatnot. And his thing was the pressure of being successful and what it brought to the table and exactly the things you were describing. Like, are people still going to see me for who I am and be my friends because of who I am or is it because of 
what I bring to the table as in, you know, I'm a celebrity, yeah. I'm, a, I'm this rich dude and wow, yeah, never thought about it. And of course, it does probably fuel some self-sabotage in a, in a lot of people when you're not happy with the way things are going. You, you might actually sabotage your own success in, in some ways. Yeah, and I mean, I feel people, a lot of players end up with some kind of financial thermostat. Um, so, I mean, the classic one for poker players that I see come up an awful lot, more so when I was working with mid-state players, but the the $100,000 bankroll. Like, there are so many guys who, they're a successful player and they reach $100,000. And then two years later, they've got a $100,000 bankroll. And they sometimes go up to 120 and they sometimes go down to 80, but they basically have a $100,000 bankroll. Um, that doesn't make a lot of sense unless there's a psychological issue creating that. Why do you think that is? Because I also have seen it. It's comfort level. So they feel that they're comfortable. They're rich at 100,000. Like they're safe, basically. You've got right. a safety net there. Um, and there's a chance of being less safe if you get higher than that. So you've got to start, as I say, it starts changing who you are and your friendship dynamics. So if all of your friends have roughly that amount of money, it's a very comfortable place to be. And there's not a lot that you can't do if you have that money in place and you feel comfortable. Um, if you get to 200, if you get to 400, if you get to a million dollars, suddenly it's changing the social dynamics around you. You're now no longer in really the situation that probably most of your friends and family are in. Um, you take yourself out of the, the situations of a normal person working a normal job. So not an awful lot of people have bigger savings than $100,000. people, $100,000. Um, so suddenly in your friendship group, when you're going to a restaurant with your friends, everything feels slightly different to how it felt before, or at least you're scared that it will feel different. Um, and you know, these things aren't on a conscious level. The player definitely doesn't think, Hey, I want to stick to a hundred thousand, but they will notice that that hasn't changed over a number of years. And it's one of the questions I'll ask people when, you know, I'm, I'm doing sort of an intake with them as a client, you know, sort of where is your bankroll at? And how long has it been at this level? And if it's been at that level for a very long time, that's usually something I want to be looking at and working on um, because more likely than not, they're keeping themselves at that level. I mean, oftentimes, you know, I'll see things like gambling coming in post over a certain level, sort of gambling the money away to bring themselves back. Um, yeah, so it's just these sorts of things that you wouldn't necessarily think of, but they do come up in the sessions when we're dealing with the subconscious. And then you start to see these themes. And once you see the themes, it, it, it makes a lot of sense as to why people might be struggling to reach the top of whatever they're doing. Wow. So interesting. Because, you know, when whenever most people think about, uh, okay, what's, what's holding me back to, a, to achieving success? Fear of success is the least likely of the things they would come up with uh, themselves, yet that makes uh, a lot of sense. Um, wow, I don't, I don't even, I don't even know what to say because you know, so far we, we've talked for ten minutes, and I am so impressed by the fact that you know, whenever I hear a concept that makes so much sense instantly yet I know I haven't thought about it. Mm. It indicates that, wow, you know, I've been missing something. It's, there's something there, yeah. Right, and uh, it's just so powerful, the things that you're talking. How do you think that relates to, let's say an average poker player, somebody who would perhaps hasn't achieved the big success yet, hasn't reached that comfortable level of, of their number of 100,000? Do you see... Uh, similar type of behavior, similar type of problems uh, on those level, uh, lower levels, maybe they manifest themselves a bit differently? Yeah, well, I mean, it, that thermometer can be set anywhere. You know, for some people, it's $2,000 a month. You know, they, they just never get above that level. Um, but it's, it's, very, it's very frequent for the amount of money a person to be making to be something that is sort of they're living a comfortable life for them. So that's something that just comes up that once they feel safe and comfortable, it can be very hard to jump to that next level. Um, one of the exercises that I recommend all poker players do, um, especially if you are sort of low stakes or mid stakes and you're looking to reach the top, is um, 
start thinking about whoever you respect most in the game of poker. So whoever you consider the number one player to be or the player that you would like to emulate over your career. And start putting a list together of all of the things that they do to be that player. So the level of study, the amount of volume, the social network that they have in place, their health and fitness, the things they do for their mindset, um, the way that they study, the software that they use, etc. Just put together a list of all the things that allow that person to be dominant in the industry. And then the sort of the more difficult part of the exercise, go through and honestly answer how many of those things you're doing yourself. And usually there's a massive discrepancy between what the player is doing and what the person they're looking to emulate is doing. Um, and, you know, you already knew exactly what to do because you know what the top in the industry are doing. And you've got to see that you've been choosing to not put in that level of effort. And then by showing yourself the discrepancy, you have a target for what you need to do if you truly want to reach that place. And I think that's that's sort of a useful starting point for most poker players um, when they're saying, you know, I have these goals, I want to be the best in the world, or I want to reach the top of my game type. Um, compare yourself to the end boss, what the end boss does, and then just you know, have a really honest conversation with yourself as to why you're choosing not to do all of those things. Wow. And sorry, I just got interrupted for a second, but uh, I want to say one thing that caught my uh, ear, so to say, <laughs> is um, I don't want, I don't know how to phrase it, but um, the fact that, you know, you were saying that basically most of the things you already know that you're supposed to be doing them, but you choose not to do them. That that word choose is the key word, I think, because that is really a decision. You know, we, we fool ourselves all very often thinking of, yeah, I want to achieve this. Yes, I'm doing my best. Yet we're not really choosing to really do our best, knowing perhaps that if we fail, that's going to really hurt. If we go um, full, full full commitment and we fail, that hurts. If we don't go full commitment and we fail, doesn't hurt just as much because we we down deep down we know that there was more that we could have done. Yeah, and and this is a big part of the fear fear of failure part of the work that I do. Um, so this is typically what you see. It's an ego defense to not do everything you know, because like you say, you can you can lie to yourself. You can say, well, I had the potential to be the best. But I chose to, you know, I didn't do the networking that I had to. I didn't um, get the right solver program because it was a bit too expensive or I didn't put in, you know, whatever it is, whatever excuse you want to create for yourself. Um, and something that comes up a lot with the hypnotherapy, I'm trying to understand why people feel this way. So why are they holding themselves back? Why would that program have been created in your mind to, to protect your ego when obviously it's going against your, your best chances of success? Um, and what it brings up for in a lot of poker players that I talk to is we'll go back into their memories and they'll start talking about being at school and being very intelligent compared to the other kids. So usually at a younger age. Mm -hmm. So they're feeling like they don't have to work and all the other kids have to work and they get A's anyway. Then as they get later into school and the exams get a little bit more difficult, um, oftentimes they choose not to study or revise and they're happy getting B's without studying, but they're uncomfortable going for A's and studying because if they study and they don't get the A, it tells them they're not as clever as they thought they were. And if they don't study, they can tell themselves and other people, well, if I studied, I would have got an A. I would have been the top in class. So they're removing the risk of finding out they're not the best um, because they were used to, at an earlier age, being able to be the best without putting in any effort. And this is just like a protection mechanism. And then we see it through university and then we see it again through um, poker as well, where they know exactly what they need to study. They know the weak areas of their game, but they're keeping this excuse that, hey, you know, I chose to not do this. I knew I should have done it, but I didn't. Had I done this, I would have been one of the top players and the ego is kept comfortable. Wow. Yeah, and I suppose that same ego is what holds people in that comfort zone, 
right? The, the comfort zone you, was, you were talking about earlier, the 100,000 mark, for example, because once you start identifying yourself with, let's say you identify yourself as a, I'm a mid-high stakes grinder, mm. right? To go higher and fail, that's quite a risk for a lot of people, right? So you'd rather remain in that comfortable level, which sort of, you know, your identity is safe there. You know, you can pull it off. And also you've got to remember the job of the subconscious really is just to keep us safe. And generally change is dangerous. So if you are fed, you've got a roof over your head and you've got a network of people around you that you're, whether or not you're where you want to be in that social group, but there is a social group keeping you safe, there will be a bit of a battle with the subconscious to make any change to that. Because like I said, if you if you really shoot for the success, you know, it is lonely at the top. You will lose a lot of friends typically when because people can't cope with you excelling past them. Um, you know, so there there is a genuine risk when you do become successful that your social life does change and people do treat you differently. Um, so you know, your subconscious is trying to protect you from this thing that is to some extent true. Um but you also have access to a lot more interesting people and potentially better friends as well when you reach that next stage. But, you know, the truth of it is, is if you really try and improve yourself, if you self-develop, um, there, there's going to be relationships that will probably end up left behind. Or if they're not left behind, they'll, they'll certainly be very different than they were in the past. Um, because it puts pressure on people when they see you starting to really perform it makes them question their own behavior and it's easier to blame you for outperforming than blaming themselves for, for not keeping up. Mm -hmm. Wow. So if we think about ego, which is a thing that holds a lot of people back and it's a, it's a dangerous thing. It's a thing that would cause a lot of emotions uh, where emotions shouldn't be taking any part in your decisions. How, how should somebody manage that? If we think about jumping out of your comfort zone, aiming for a higher goal, yet not attaching yourself to, to some label, not you know, putting a label on yourself, but hey, I'm, I'm one of the best, so no. I'm going to keep doing everything to prove that I'm one of the best. And as soon as that is no longer a thing, I'm going to basically bail out and fall back to the comfort zone. How should people navigate that? I, I think one of the, the best ways of, of working towards your goals in poker is setting your goals to becoming process oriented goals rather than monetary goals or better than whoever goals. So, you know, your job is to play your A game as much as possible to put in X amount of study hours, um, to follow your bankroll um, rules, to make sure that when you're playing, you take the breaks when you said you were going to take them and you finish your sessions when you said you were going to finish them, except for in extreme circumstances. Um, you're going to do the exercise that you said that you were going to do because you know that it improves your focus over time. You're going to get in your meditation. And if you start to see you fulfilling your daily obligations as that, that is you hitting your goal. So your goal is to do today what you said you were going to do today. That over time will make you the best poker player that you can be. Um, it removes a lot of the ego side. If your goal is to make $100,000 this year or this month or you know wherever you are in the game, um, it's, it's a different sort of situation. And it's, it's much easier for the ego to get over involved because either you know, desperately involved to hit it or terribly scared that you're not going to hit it. Whereas if you set the goals on the process, um, again, it comes back down to that sort of choice word. It is just a choice if you follow that process or if you don't follow that process. And by having it as a choice, you have much more control and it doesn't become quite such an ego exercise. Mm. And speaking of control, also just attaching your goals to, let's say, monetary results, which is something you, you're not in charge of in poker. You're not in control of the cards. You can't really, you, it's not up to you what you're going to earn. It's up to you how you're going to execute it, how you're going to make your decisions and how you're going to follow your process as you were describing. But really just 
you know, the monetary goal, it's not up to you. And what if you set out to make a hundred thousand this year and happen to make the hundred thousand on fifth of January? Are you taking the rest of the year off? Like, and, how and that creates that issue. I've seen I've seen people set monthly targets, and you know, twenty days into the month, they've hit their target, and then they say, "Hey, we've gone on a break." Like, and, and that's not we we know you know they even logically know that's not how poker works over the long term. Um, but that is one of the dangers sending setting monetary goals in that sense that you either hit it too early, um, or you get very frustrated. Like people start playing differently when they're getting close to hitting it, that sort of thing. So that's why I say like really focusing on that process instead. Um, I think is a much healthier way for for players to approach the game. Mm. Have you seen uh, some of your people that you were working on uh, with um, struggle with? the dollar amounts you oh, know certainly um you know a question that that comes up is you know how like i'll, I'll get people say you know how am i supposed to deal with this when it's a car either way right. if i yeah. win or lose the hand it's a car um you know and that's serious and i mean in some cases it's like um you will have seen matt burkey saying in some of the videos that you know we're playing for houses and they genuinely are playing for houses in those games in Las Vegas. You know, a there will be pots that can swing five hundred to a million dollars either way. Um, so, really, where this changes is if you can separate in your mind your bankroll from your your life roll, and your bankroll starts to become like an investment fund, like you're managing it like a stockbroker. And you're looking to get a return on that investment fund over the year by making good trades. And in, you know the, the trades for a card player are individual hands. But really what you're looking at is a solid return on investment over 12 months. So starting to sort of separate from it, making sure that your, your life role is separate to your bankroll. Um, can be really powerful. And it doesn't matter what stakes, it doesn't need to be millions of dollars. It can just be a case of if you're used to playing $100 hands and you move to $500 hands, um, that's stressful. It changes things. And really, one of the key factors in this is having bankroll management and not playing the bigger hands before you can afford to, because oftentimes that means you try and minimize the variance and ironically probably damage your edge. Um, by trying to minimize your variance in places where you shouldn't be trying to minimize your variance. Um, and then also sort of a visualization technique that I've seen quite useful that I've had clients do is um, let's say you're moving up from um, 100 zoom to 200 zoom. Um, when you're meditating, when you're visualizing your sessions, instead of visualizing 200, visualize playing 500 and the pot size is there. So you sort of keep repeatedly playing the next stake size up in your mind. Um, your mind doesn't really know the difference between things that you imagine and reality. So it responds in the same way. So what this means is you can actually start to get yourself used to the bigger pot sizes. Um, your mind will become more accepting of it. And then when you actually do play in the 200 zoom, you're going to have less of a, a visceral response to it because you've been preparing yourself for a higher figure than that. Hmm. Oh, that's so interesting because I'm thinking back to some points in my career where uh, for a long time I was playing live poker predominantly for money and online poker as a way to improve my game. Right. Mm. So whenever I'm not traveling, I'm I'm focusing on on the online poker in a capacity of this is my field of study, this is my training ground. But I always felt, you know, the first day on the trip where I arrive somewhere and, you know, just the first orbit and you get that 20,000, 30,000 pot, the heart races because, you know, you, online, the pots are way smaller, especially yeah. the stakes that I was playing online. Yet I know that these are going to be the types of pots I play every day, many times a day throughout the whole summer, for example. So that's nothing special, really. And, you know, the, the second day or the third day, there's zero emotion. But yet that first day, that first pot, it's that. always a thing. Even just after taking a break, you know, like there's a two month break between these trips and it's still always, always was there. And I always wondered, like, 
how come? Like, what is the explanation? Because it really, I, I couldn't figure it out. Like, why, why does it well, still matter? I mean, I would guess that this, you know, you've had a couple of months without playing those sorts of parts. And when you look at something in the shops and it's $500, it seems like it's expensive. And, you know, for the first time in three months, you're going to play a pot that's $20,000. Um, you know, and this is these sort of the tricks the mind plays on you. Um, and I would also say that that visualization as a tool over those two months of not playing is a powerful way to stay within the game psychologically. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would say investing some time in really playing through in your mind the hands, keeping yourself thinking about pot sizes of that size, thinking about how it would feel if you did have to play a 20,000 pot. And again, instead of visualizing, visualizing 20,000 pots, if you know that's normal in your game, you start to visualize $40,000 pots. Um, and then when, when it comes to playing, um, your mindset will be a little bit more robust than it would have been. Um, if you've been putting, if you've been replaying that in your mind the whole way through, so it just keeps you a little bit more in the mm. game. Oh yeah, absolutely. I can I can totally see it working. I mean, I've seen it I've happen to me time and time mm. again. Whenever you 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 know you get out of your comfort zone, and all of a sudden that is the extraordinary big pot. Next time you're playing your average pot, you know the twenty thousand doesn't seem that much anymore because you're like, well, okay, that's that's really not that big of a deal, but um. I want to ask you about clarity of goals. I feel like a lot of people in poker have a problem with that, not having clear goals, not having clear direction, not having a clear idea of what they're trying to achieve. Uh, how do you work with that? Um, well, the first thing is really the player understanding what they want personally out of poker. And, and that can be very different. Um, for different players. So, you know, is it that you want financial freedom? Is it that you want to help your family? Is it that you want to work from home? Um, or is it that you truly want to be the best in the world and being the best in the world, being number one is the thing that makes you happy. And for most players, they'll, they'll sort of in an initial conversation, you know, so what do you want your poker career to look like? And they'll say, Hey, I want to reach the high rollers. I want to do this. I want to. And then when you really dig into it, they're actually looking for an opportunity to work from home and to have financial freedom. And that's a very different goal from wanting to be top in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think it's this honesty of what you're really looking The starting point needs to be an honesty of what you're really looking for in life and what you're really looking for in the game. And when you have that in place, you can start to put together the, the what your daily, weekly, monthly goals should be. But, it's much more about this honesty of, well, really, are you really looking to be the top in the world? Or are you looking to make enough money that you don't have to go to work? You can spend more time with your family. And, you know, it's quite normal, probably 80% of professional players. Um, in reality, if if they do have that 100,000 and they're, they're comfortable and they're playing 25 hours of poker a week and doing eight to 10 hours of study, they're actually really happy with their life. And it's okay for that to be a goal. Um, but as I say, it's this honesty of what they really want that allows you to create the, the sort of the clearer goals over the, the time spans. Mm. And I also feel like the closer you get to that sort of greatness, you know, to the closer you get to being the best, the more you realize how incredibly difficult it is to get there and how it is to maintain it to be there. Because I've seen, I've recently talked to Stefan. Uh, mm -hmm. And Fedor, and of course, you work with both of them, right? And I've seen. Oh, I've, I've only. I, I didn't work with Stefan. Oh, you didn't work with Stefan? No, no. no. Well, that's I, why I, he I've quit talk, I've talk, earlier. I've, talk, I've, talk, I've, talk, I've talked to Stefan. I've interviewed him and things, but right. you know, I, I don't want to lay claims. Though. Okay, okay. Well, well. Anyway, but you worked with Fedor definitely, and a, and a lot, and one of one of the biggest examples of just how much good your work does. You know, because mm. he gives you a lot of credit for for his success and in many ways. Um, but to me, what was fascinating in a conversation with both of them, how they reached the point where you sort of achieve the best or near best status, and then you realize, okay, it's done. But then what? And and then sort of the whole identity and whole vision of where you want to be shifts. 
And I feel like that's happening to a lot of people before they even reach the greatness. They realize, you know what? I thought I want to do this. It's way too much work. And what's in it for me there really? Because the money that you make as the best player in the world or in a top 100 is not that big of a difference. You know, as long as you get into good games, as long as you... Because there's more to it. It's not just being yeah, the, present the in... Yeah, it's yeah. just huge. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the truth of everything. I, you know, I work with a lot of top performers in a lot of different activities, you know, from sports to business, trading, poker. Um, and the truth of it is there is no end to the journey. Mm -hmm. So if you your goal is to become number one in poker, you can enjoy that journey and you can reach your goal, but there's no happy ever after. You know, it's not all oh, well done. I've reached number one. I can be happy forever now. That, that's just not how it works for people. Um, and usually people move on and it, it's a growth point for them where they realize that perhaps some other things are important or perhaps there's something else for them to do. Um, where I think reaching that level of anything is incredibly important is that I believe skills can be crossed over. So um, I guess an example of this would be when I see um, players who are, let's say they're lower stakes or they're, they're just getting started. They take it seriously, but they're not, you know, high stakes player. And I ask them, what game types do you play? And they tell me basically all game types. So I play mixed games, I play No Limit, I play PLO, and I play online and I play live. Right? It's going to be very difficult for that player to ever be good at any of those games. Um, where I see people being successful is they play No Limit own exclusively, they become an expert, and then if they want to take on PLO, they have this framework for reaching success in PLO. Um, and that's where you see the players who are very good at multiple game types. I usually find that they, they've become an expert in one and they've used that same process to then learn the other games afterwards. I believe it's the same with success in any subject. So if you become the best poker player in the world, it, you have a framework where you can then extrapolate that to other things. So then if you want to go and work in charity or you want to work in business or you want to try a different game or a different variant of poker or whatever it might be, you're much more likely to be able to do it because you have the context and you've seen that level of success. So I would say that's the biggest benefit of reaching the top of anything isn't that the, hey, I can be happy forever now, which is what people view it as. They see that as the end game. Mm -hmm. It's the, they now have a framework that can allow them to be successful in something else, which is the next part of their development as a human and part of their journey. Um, does that make sense as a description of that? Yeah, absolutely. It makes sense. And also I'm thinking back to the beginning of our conversation where, um, again, I'm searching for words, but um, how should I describe? Well, well basically... Anyway, I'm going to get back. To, I, I don't want to pause here because I have a point to make, but I don't want to slow us down. I just want to just come back and I'm going to make sure that I address this point again. Mm -hmm. But uh, one thing that I've, um, I want to address, which is sort of glided over when you said treat your bankroll as a business investment part, right? Mm -hmm. And I've recently uh, listened to your latest podcast episode that you've published uh, with uh, was it James Woodett, I think, yeah. um, which was a really, really great uh, interview. Oh. And by the way, guys, if you haven't, if, if you don't know, Elliot has a wonderful podcast and I'm going to put all the links in the description. You should definitely go check it out. There's so much great material out there. But part of that conversation you were having was about treating your poker as a business. And it's, and it's so hugely, hugely important. And now back to the point of, you know, this transition of the skills of how reaching the top allows you uh, to, to sort of apply what you've learned in that process into other areas. I wanted to get back to the beginning of our conversation when you uh, said that the problems that you have in the game, it's not something that happens because of the game. You bring your problems with you and poker sort of exposes them because it puts you in this environment where you are you have to face your demons. You have to face the problems that were always there deep down. So basically, if you do reach the top, 
if you go through this process of fighting these these problems or recognizing the things that slow you down and things that hold you back, now you know how to do the same thing anywhere else because you always bring your you know, baggage with you, whatever whatever you you mm, take on. Yeah, and and I think that's a that's a good way of putting it because you don't reach the top without resolving a lot of these problems. It's just not realistic. Um, certainly not in modern poker. You know, maybe five, ten years ago, probably ten years ago, it was easier to reach the top still with significant mindset issues. But I would say now it is quite rare we see huge outbursts and things with with the very best players in the world. Um, mm. And, you know, the the player who comes to me who has anxiety issues at the table, oftentimes they have anxiety issues in their normal everyday life. The player with anger issues at the table has anger issues. You know, when they're driving their car, they're screaming at the other cars. It's it's just who they are. And it's a problem that they need to resolve rather than the poker makes them angry or the poker makes them anxious. Or, you know, one of the things is like, oh, I, you know, I get, it makes me so angry when or upset or whatever it might be when my aces get cracked. Um, you know, it's not the aces getting cracked that are making them angry because plenty of people can just be absolutely fine with that because they know they got their money in good. So it's, it's what it means to you as a person having your aces cracked, the entitlement, you know, the injustice that you're feeling, you've brought that entitlement and injustice to the table. Um, the fact that there are many people who don't feel that same way means it's a personal issue. It's nothing to do with the game. Oh, absolutely. And that, that problem of feeling entitled, I've experienced it myself early on in my career and I've pretty much everybody that I know and who really had an honest conversation with me on the topic, everybody had that at some point, one for one shape or form. Because poker does expose you to it by the nature of the game. When, when you are going to have these bad streaks of really unlucky circumstances and, and you feel like, why is this happening to me? Why, mm -hmm. why is this happening to me? Why is this guy winning where he clearly doesn't even know how to play? And that's that's something that I, I, I suppose most of the poker players have to overcome at some point if, if they're serious about getting getting better at the game. Um, yeah. if, if you don't resolve that, um, it's going to be hard to play your best poker consistently because yeah. you're going to have downswings. Like, yeah, <laughs> it doesn't matter who you are. <laughs> like, yes. yeah. There's definitely, if you play for a number of years, you, you're going to see a period of time when luck goes against you. Right. And by the way, guys in the chat, I really appreciate all of you. I'm I'm not really paying attention to it that much because I'm too captivated by the conversation we have with Elliot and I don't want to sort of go on a tangent here. So still, I appreciate all of you, but uh, I'm sorry if we don't address any of the things that you're talking about. I'm keeping an eye on it though. But you've mentioned a downswing just now and everybody has to deal with them. What about Phil Galfond? You I think you probably followed the challenge, right? Because oh, I was I was coaching him. Through. You were coaching him. Yeah. Tell me about that, because I'm so fascinated. This is gonna go down in history as one of the greatest feats, I think. Never mind the downswing, upswing type of thing, because that's again, you know, you can't really control the results, and it's a nice story, nice narrative, like a rocky. Uh, you know, wonderful. Uh, he was knocked, uh, knocked down, down he and he stood up and, and, and he, he won around. the championship, right? A beautiful story. But that doesn't really impress me. What impresses me is how he handled it. Mm. You know, the, the level of resolve, the level of consistency at just chipping away session after session, just doing his thing, handle it beautifully uh can you expand on that like as much as you can talk about how you worked with him what you guys uh, did because from outside this is just one of the most beautiful stories we had in poker yeah i mean i actually i actually have an interview we, we recorded a mindset interview that's going to come out this week actually mm -hmm. talking quite a lot in, in, in a lot of detail so he's been very open about the mindset work we did and i think that comes out on friday um that they run it once they're going to release a, an interview that we did talking specifically about the mindset. Mm -hmm. um, but sort of as an overview, um, one is Phil with or without me is incredibly mentally tough and that it's his nature um, to deal with things in a very rational way anyway. 
So, you know, that, that, that is a, that is a part of it. He has been through big down swings before and he, he does have that level of consistency. Um, obviously this was a very extreme situation, probably one of the most extreme situations you could have in poker where, you know, you've put out a public challenge and it's hard to imagine it going any worse than it went over the first few weeks. Um, oh yeah. It, it was, <laughs> it was about as bad as it could have been. Um, the first, the first part was, I think, of, of his success was um, making the decision to take the break and give himself some space and not having too much ego of just playing through once he felt that he wasn't playing his best. So seeing it as it's going to cost me $3,000 a day, but I'm happy to pay that to really assess where I'm truly at. And I think most players would have struggled at that phase and the break wouldn't have even happened. Um, so I think that was the first real huge win, um, was getting to a stage where the break was acceptable for him. Um, he gave himself the time and then could reassess the way that he was playing and his mindset. And, you know, the, pa the pattern recognition comes up a lot with players. When you're on a downswing, you're seeing the best, you know, your, your, your opponent keeps showing up with the best hand and it's card distribution most of the time. Um, but the way that the mind processes it does mean that sometimes, you know, your gut feeling starts to become a bit off because you've just got this expectation that they're always going to have it. Um, and then a lot of the work that we did was about for each session, trying to remove as much emotion as possible and play each session just as an individual session of, right, your only job today is to solve each hand as a puzzle, move to the next one. There's no expectation of results. Your only job is to play him as well as you possibly can, um, playing your game and enjoy your time at the table. And what we saw was this sort of shift in sort of, I think, expectation. Once, once the break had happened, really, it was just a case of anything any anything lower than a seven a nine hundred thousand loss was a win to some extent, and then when we started to see this you know consistent wins day after day chipping away, and just trying to keep him emotionally on the only thing that's important is the day session being in the zone, blocking the rest of the world out, solving each hand, not worrying about the results of each individual hand. Um, we just saw this chipping away, like you say, chipping away, chipping away, and. I, I really felt that the final session was like a, it was like a mini story of the whole challenge itself as well. Um, you know, it was like, it was, um, it was so interesting to watch and exciting to watch. I don't, I don't know if you saw it live on the last. Oh day. yeah. I, I, I couldn't not have missed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, when I think he was what, like 31,000, uh, Venny was 31,000 ahead. And um, he only needs to reach, I think, 36,000 to finish the challenge. And then we saw Phil, like he, he, you know, obviously tried to reduce the variance a bit. And we saw Phil just chipping it back again, like gradually grinding it back, grinding it back, grinding it back until then he took that break. And it really just felt to me like we were watching the, the sort of a mini version of the entire two months play out over a two hour period during that fought. And then obviously, you know, there's luck involved, you know, things mm -hmm. could have easily gone the other way with it. But I really felt in my mind, he had won even if he'd lost on the last day. That that's genuinely how I I went into the last day feeling. I was like, look, Phil, we we've, we've won this. Um because the comeback is so extraordinary. Yes, it's great if we get the get the side bet win and such, but the truth of it is the level of comeback and the demonstration of mindset. Um, I really felt that it was a win, no matter how that final hand had played out. If it had gone the other way, I still would have considered it a, a win for Phil and, you know, just a, a show of his true mental strength and, and the way that he deals with things. Absolutely. I, I can totally agree with you, even though it's not easy for me to agree with this because Venny is a friend of mine. Oh, okay. So, I, I, so you were definitely yeah. watching. <laughs> I, I was definitely watching, yeah, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I think he handled his part beautifully as well. I don't want to take anything away from him because, you know, he's obviously not so much in the public eye, but uh, it's just what a great performance by both of them. And what incredible. a great display of, you know, what it is to be at the highest level, both in poker, um, 
and just your mental game, right? Because they both went through similar things and they fought it out to the last minute. It was incredible. But I think a lot of people sort of um, glide over the fact, you know, Venny didn't have to deal um, if dealing with an upswing is a thing, right? But I think in Phil's position, dealing with an upswing must have been a thing because once he's chipping away and once he's getting back and because you have that watermark sort of that zero that you want to get back to or above that it must have been not very easy as well just you know it seems to a lot of people it might seem like well you know it's a good day when you win two hundred thousand. like what is there to to worry about but i know the feeling of after a great day coming back full focus no ego process only in the front of your mind for the next session that's not an easy thing but i mean that's literally the specific thing that we were putting an incredible amount of work on because it's not easy so you know a lot of the work that we were doing was just about you know yes you know, it was clear you know, the momentum had swung but it could have swung back on any day of the other end of that challenge um so it's the not getting over excited and each day resetting and setting it up as this is just another there is no narrative there is no story you have to play these hands as well as you can and and we're trying you know our best to get him into that state each day where there isn't you know there is nothing else to worry about other than you know how do you play this number of big blinds against your opponent and mm -hmm. it, you know that it really seemed to to be an effective way of of gaining control because you know it like you say that being on the upswing, it is very stressful. Um, but the way Phil described it, as I say, that, that interview will be out in a couple of days, is he said, it was very stressful. However, it wasn't as stressful as had it been going the other way. So he said, you know, there's, there's stress on the downswing and there's stress on the upswing, but it's a different type of stress on the upswing to the downswing. Oh, yeah. Because probably of what you've mentioned already earlier, that on a downswing, you have this bias in the way you see things. You have that self-doubt constantly expecting the, the other player the to show up with the nuts. Exactly. And constantly thinking, my bluff is not going to work and my call is going to be bad. You know, and uh, how, how much did Phil feel any pressure at all from this being public and him being publicly basically exposed in the whole process? Um, I, I mean, there's, there's definite being public. It, it, it's dramatically different, um, you know. And I'm, I'm sure the emotions were high for Venny throughout the challenge as well. But I think it is a different, the, you know. The, I mean, if we look at before the break, um, which, as I say, I really feel that was the, the key defining moment um, was the break. Um, the amount of negativity on Twitter towards Phil was incredible. Oh yeah, it, it was just you know and. And, and that, that that impacts anyone. I mean, he deals with it all incredibly well. Like he's he's a machine with all of that stuff. Mm. Um, but I still think, you know, if I say, if if we had the option of okay, you go through exactly the same situation in private or in public, which one affects you more? I would be shocked if anyone, not this isn't just Phil specific, but just anyone in the world, um, wouldn't find it more emotional if they were public facing versus not public facing. I, I just I just don't think it's possible for it not to have any impact. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose that's definitely true. Well, Elliot, I know we're we're supposed to be wrapping up, so so let's go for it. I enjoyed the conversation tremendously. And you know what? This is gonna be one of the episodes that I'm actually gonna watch myself again. Oh, <laughs> because there's yeah. so much to learn from you. It's it's incredible. I'm so grateful for you to coming on. You guys should definitely check out uh, Elliot's podcast. It's it's amazing. Uh, if you feel like it, definitely reach out to him for coaching because you can see that even in an hour of a podcast, there are so many gems. And uh, what I like about you, you seem to have a great understanding of the concepts that everybody's struggling and how to to get through those. And that's that's so important. And of course, everybody should um, look forward to your podcast with Phil. Uh, 
to that episode, which is coming on in out in a couple of days. Um, I know I'm going to be listening to that. I'm really fascinated in yeah, that story. That it's, there's a lot of cool stuff in that. Uh, oh, yeah. You shared yeah. a ton. So, yeah, amazing. So that that sounds great. And of course, the Galphon Challenge is restarting next week. I'm going to be doing commentary on on their channel one of the days. I don't know which day yet. So keep an eye out on that. I'm going to inform you guys. And once again, Elliot, what a pleasure. Thank you so much. And I'll put all the links to all of your stuff in the YouTube video once it comes out in a, a week and a half or so. And um, I hope people reach out. And I definitely, again, I can't stress this enough, subscribe to Elliot's podcast. It's, podcast. it's great. Well, appreciate it, man. And one thing I'd just like to mention as well, um, while the COVID crisis is on, um, we've massively reduced my mindset video course on Runner Once. Um, it's usually a thousand dollars, and we brought it down to two nine seven. And as well as that, until the casinos reopen, instead of doing monthly Q and A's, so you know, a bit like this, wherever I'm answering questions, I'm doing them weekly until the crisis is over because I know that a lot of people are struggling more with their mindset. So um, yeah, I think if you go to agamepoker.com and check check that out if it's of interest. But you know, we've really just tried to make it as cheap cheap as we could reasonably make it during the crisis and then i'm doing four times as many lives as well so um oh, that's so yeah, so great. yeah if you if anyone wants to work on the mental game it, it's a very very substantial course with a lot of homework and a lot of great interviews with great players and things um but in the short term whilst the crisis is on it's it's particularly good value so i would definitely check that out if you enjoyed this conversation oh that sounds amazing and yeah i can totally again i Everybody should go for it. You definitely go for it. If you can afford it, uh, even if you can't. If you can't afford it, especially, you probably need it. It's one of those things, right? Yes. And, and funny that you bring up the COVID because that was my original urge for inviting you because I thought, <laughs> we, you know what, with this, situation, <laughs> with this situation, you yeah. are so important. You know, any mental game coach is something that we all need at the moment, never mind poker, but in general in life, you know, and it's funny that the whole topic didn't even come up till the very end because we had so much to talk about. So once again, Elliot, thank you so much. I hope hey. to get in touch with you again. Uh, possibly we do another one of these if we yeah, find I, the time. I, I really enjoyed it. So um, yeah, I really appreciate the the chance to come on and more than happy to do it again in the future. Um, yeah, had a really great time. So, so thanks. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Have a good day and I'll see you all guys next week.